Apparently it's that time again. Well, not quite that time, eight o'clock Irish time. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Mythical Ireland Book Talk. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. In case you didn't know, you're all very welcome along to the Mythical Ireland Library, where tonight we are taking, well, I am taking one of the titles, and I'm going to do a little bit of reading from it and tell you a little bit about it. Anyway, I hope you're keeping well. We were live last night on Live Irish Myths, episode 126, which was the first in a series of episodes about Ka Fionthri, which is the Battle of the White Strand. And on Facebook tonight, Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house, says, hello, my lovely friends. Hello, Vicky. Haven't seen you. Well, I didn't see you last night. I'm not sure if you were there or not. But anyway, hope you're well. And hello to Evan and Chili as well. If you are there, good evening. On YouTube, John Main says, Banachti on Tua or on March, all in Shuta on Tin. Tuna che August cup on tea agum. The fire is hot and I have a cup of tea. John, I hope you're ensconced nice and comfortable. I can just imagine that you are. Oh my god, don't start this tonight, Anthony. <sighs> I do apologize. Okay, it's confession time. I put my back out on Sunday. And uh, uh, I am recovering. I'm okay. I've been trying. You may have noticed last night I didn't do a whole lot of move moving. And better today, but I didn't sleep very well Sunday night, so it's catching up on me. Daisy Peters says, Hi, Anthony, John, and all of our two at the Myth Flicks I'm ready for our amazing book talks episodes. It's always an immense pleasure to join us for our chat. It's always an immense pleasure to have you here, Daisy. You're so enthusiastic, it's great. Carl Deegan says, Oh, ta cup on che jas agum fresh and John. Carl Deegan also has a cup of tea. Listen, you're going to have to start sharing these around you know everybody's going to get jealous of all these nice cups of tea pagan tree is in the house says evening all falche trononawa polar bear says greetings from new mexico how goes it for everyone good good afternoon polar bear in new mexico yeah all in good form thanks for asking christy goodlett says woohoo she was the first one i connected with when i looked into my ancestral homeland love yuck. yeah very interesting one too Jules Cousins is in the house and is waving, says hello. Falcha, Jules, Lexi Erickson. Oh no, another book for my sagging bookcase. I tell you, as always, the problem is never that you've too many books. The problem is that you don't have enough uh, bookshelves. Janet Moran says hello, Anthony and the Tua from Boston. Good evening. Good afternoon, Janet. Michael Naylor, uh, Mike and Jeanette in New Jersey are in the house. Uh, this day last year, we were preparing to fly home from our visit to Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, myself and my wife, uh, I was giving a lecture in Princeton, but uh, we managed to get some time in New York City and in Philadelphia as well, and it was all very, very pleasant. Really, really enjoyed it. Hard to believe how much things have changed in a year, and the fact that uh, hardly anybody is flying across the Atlantic these days. Who'd have thought it would, we'd ever see the day? Wendy Holmes says, yay, book talk. <laughs> uh, Evan and Chili waving. Hello, Evan and Chili. Michelle Rhodes is in Sheffield and says, hi. Hello, Michelle. Welcome along. Charlene McLean Cosby is saying good afternoon to Anthony and all. Hello to you, Sharon Kelly Smith. Your talks always fill me with energy, says Sharon. So long as I'm not depleting my own energy reserves in the effort, that's okay. That's perfectly okay. Joe Butler is in the house. Hello, Joe. Hello from snowy Colorado. Time for the Kalyak. Absolutely. Neil Hughes, uh, Mary and Neil in Coatbridge, Scotland. Tay August Fionn Jarag, Chianti in place. Very nice. So I tell you, forget about your cups of tea there, lads. There's a glass of the ale red you want. Ralph Waldron. Tashe Gohan Fluch on Shot in you, yeah. It's very wet, isn't it, uh, Ralph? I believe the next few days are to be dry and cold. So that means hopefully it'll be sunny. Lexi Erickson says we've six inches of snow in Denver, Colorado. Looking at new bookcases now. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, Ria Uleri is in the house. Falche Porigo Komiski is here. Says greetings from Kukulin's Castle. Looking up towards the Kalyabera's house upon the top of Schlieve Gullion. Very nice, Porig. Iris. Rebel says hello from Florida. Good afternoon to you. Adina Sparks says good afternoon all. Falcha Brian Boylan says how are you? Keep it up. Might see you in the summer. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed, you know. Should we mention vaccines? Are there any anti-vaxxers here who are going to refuse to take them? Well, I tell you, uh, I see, is it is it uh, us? Is it Qantas or is, is it Australia or New Zealand? 
there was talk about airlines introducing, you know, you don't fly unless you have a, a vac- unless you've taken a vaccine. Interesting to see how that works out. Tom King says, this is just the cherry on the top. Thank you, Anthony and all the tour. Working away and the broadcast in the background, mighty stuff. Uh, delighted to hear it, Tom. And good luck with your uh, your crafting there. Uh, it seems to have been going very well lately. Some very nice pieces. Some very good inspiration, obviously, being attained from somewhere. Laura Puente says, good afternoon. It's been a long time. I've been busy at work, but looking forward to this wonderful reprieve with my tour. Indeed, great to have you along, Laura. Dawn Hilton says, hello to everyone, and that it's cold and windy in Lancashire. Yes, indeed. Same here. Good evening to you. Yvette Tillema is in the house. You won't need me to tell you what book we're reading tonight, Yvette. <laughs> says, uh, so excited here about the book, The Kalyuk. Uh, do some press-ups for your thrown-out back like a push-up. Wow, I can't do a press-ups when I'm, when I'm feeling healthy. Yet. I'll give it a try. Uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> and yes, Colleen is saying, I'll never take a vaccine. Oh, fair enough. But look... If you die of COVID, at least you know why. Anne Hurley says, hello to Anthony and all the beautiful people. Good evening, Anne. I was being a little bit flippant there, yes. But, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, let's not turn it into a vaccine discussion because it's only going to go one way, downhill. Dave Hanna says, good evening, Anthony. Fulcher, Dave. Adina Sparks is saying hello to Evan and Chili and uh, uh, Vicky. Who else? Paul Garron is in the house. Good evening, everyone. Goch Dinner. Fulcher, Paul, good to see you. Iris Frebel says, smoke a joint, easier. <laughs> Giggle snort, Anthony says, Vicky. <laughs> uh, uh, I Sorry, I was being a bit flippant there. Um, I wouldn't wish anybody to contract COVID, but um, we all have our own opinions uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the wisdom of either taking or not taking vaccines. Uh, but you know what? I was vaccinated against several things when I was a baby, such as measles, mumps, and rubella, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Nicholas O'Fuelon says, Conas a tashiv galera nacht o kunde fluch fort larga ta natua abu. It's fluch everywhere a nacht, Nicholas, isn't it? It's one of those nights. But anyway, apparently it's supposed to clear during the night and it's supposed to be bright and cold tomorrow. The Starry Path says, first time I'm catching alive. Yay. Happy to be here. Well, welcome along the Starry Path. Very nice name, considering some of the things we do be talking about. Good to see you. Christy Goodlett says, I married an ancestral Scot, so the Kalyak is VIP in our home. <laughs> Anne Sieben says, greetings from Chimayo, New Mexico. Hello, Anne. Good evening. Good afternoon. Helen Hirsch Chatter, is it Chatter? Says, greetings from South Dakota. Hello, Helen. Good afternoon to you. Welcome along. Hall- Halle B04, no press ups. This is a physio talking. Yeah, I, I can't do press ups anyway, so that's my excuse. <laughs> um, Barb Jordan here with Main Squeeze Louise. Hello, Barb and Main Squeeze Louise. <laughs> Karen Gogus is in the house. With God's help, BioNTech vaccine will be safe. All righty then, says Colleen. <laughs> Sorry, I was. I was a little bit flippant, uh, and I, I shouldn't. Uh, Valerie Gallagher says hello. Falchik, Valerie, welcome along. Anyway, tonight we are on Book Talk. We didn't do an episode last week. I'll be honest, I was exceptionally busy last week. Um, my father who is at the age of 76, is a a semi-retired, still not retired uh, journalist uh, of 57 years standing. Uh, Finally, after years of being encouraged and cajoled to do so, uh, has produced his memoirs in the form of his new book. Guess who was doing the editing and the proofreading and the layout of and design of said book? Muggins. Anyway, um, it's gone to print, so uh, that is a, 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 a relief and a, a great uh, celebration, and I'm looking forward to seeing copies of it. it so it should be said that I get my, uh, you know the way they say, um, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and, you know, uh, my father being a journalist and a, a writer, it, it's a, sort of a natural progression for me to do the same. Uh, but it has taken me to write six books for him to write his first. <laughs> and I always thought he would outdo me. I always thought he would be the first one to write a book. But anyway, uh, he finally has written it and it is 
rolling, I believe, uh, presently on the printing presses, uh, or at least the plates are being set up and will shortly be doing so. And we're hoping to see copies of it at the back end of next week. So always busy here in the Mythical Ireland headquarters between work and Mythical Ireland and everything else, calendars and books and websites and videos and patrons and blogs and podcasts and reading stuff and writing stuff. It's never ending. But sure, what, what other way would you want it to be? You know, a busy, busy uh, life is a very fulsome life, I believe. So before I get to talk about the main event, and we're already 10 minutes in, I'm sorry, I'm waffling now. I should say that there are two arrivals in the Mythical Ireland Library today, which will make episodes in the future. In fact, I think this one will make Live Irish Myths. Uh, it is a forgotten books reprint of Celtic Wonder Tales uh, by Ella Young, a book I don't have in my collection. I'd love to have an original. I probably will try to get one at some stage um, because this is not a facsimile reprint and I don't like those as much. I like the ones where they're a uh, facsimile reprint of the original. Anyway, uh, this is sort of an imaginative reweaving of some of the Irish uh, mythological stories and it's very, very romantic and mystical. It's really lovely actually. So I reckon that would make an episode of Live Irish Myths before too long. And the other one which you may have seen me talking about earlier on is this one called Mapping Death. Uh, burial in Late Iron Age and Early Medieval Ireland. And that's by Elizabeth O'Brien. And I'm looking forward to, i probably be honest, it's, it's, it's the sort of book I did sort of dip into it today that I can't imagine I will read from cover to cover, but rather the sort of book, uh, like many in my reference library, uh, that I will read sections of and dip in and out of. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I, I, I know that I will learn from it. That's the important thing. Anyway, if you're interested in uh, uh, obtaining a copy, that's available on the Four Courts Press website, fourcourtspress.ie. And the book will actually cost you the princely sum of 50 euros plus postage and packaging. Not cheap, but then these academic tomes usually aren't produced to a very high standard. Uh, feels uh, lovely in the hand, lovely dust jacket on it, and even the way this the the silver uh, gilting is done along the uh, the spine, the the words are actually um, uh, in in a sort of a, a shiny silver silvery writing, which is beautiful. Uh, lovely hardback book should should hopefully stand the test of time, and uh, maybe we'll get to review that in a future episode of. Five Irish myths. So I realized actually for a while there, I was so busy between one thing and another, between um, trying to get Island of the Setting Sun 2020 to print and then designing the calendar that I hadn't actually been reading as much and I hadn't been buying books. So I'm not sure where I'm going to put them, but that's that's another day's work. The Book of the Kalyak was published tonight's the feature of tonight's um, Episode is the Book of the Kalyak by Gerog O'Krulek. Uh, and O'Krulek, O'Krulek is the Irish, or should I say, the anglicized version of the, his surname is O'Krilly. Uh, uh, it was published by Cork University Press in, I think, 2003. Yes, reprinted in 2006 and 2007. Uh, I'll, I'll read a tiny bit about uh, Gerog. Uh, I believe he's, he's retired now, but at the time he wrote the book, he was Professor of folk, Folklore and Ethnology in University College Cork, UCC, and is regarded as one of the most original thinkers in these fields. He is the author of numerous academic articles and a leading authority on the Kalyak. So I'm going to read a few uh, bits and pieces. I can always tell that I've really enjoyed a book when I see many underlined passages and uh, margin notes and asterisks and NBs and all sorts of symbols in the margins. I always know that I have uh, immensely enjoyed a book when I see lots of bits and pieces underlined and, uh, as I say, uh, uh, margin notes, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, this is one that I really, really enjoyed. Looking at the sort of um, in the popular market, as it were, this is a 
book written by a scholar, but written for a sort of a general audience. It is a little bit scholarly. It's a little bit weighty. Uh, it's a little bit heavy, heavy in, in, in linguistic terms, uh, the language. Uh, I love it, but then I'm, I love the English language and I, I love learning the meaning of words that I'm not, you know, I, I love learning new words and get myself, you know, um, familiar with the meanings of others. And I'll read uh, from the back cover, which usually uh, tells us, Patricia McAteer is in the house. Hello. NB, uh, note bene, as in, you know, uh, you know, take note of this. This is very important. Usually I write NB when something is important, but then I've got loads of NBs, so like loads of stuff is important. Valerie, Valerie Gallagher says, talking to the book. <laughs> My precious. <laughs> Anyone else that I miss? Claire Quinn. Where can I buy a copy of the book of the Kalyuk? I'm sorry I missed the name of the first recommended book. I actually don't know outside of the likes of Amazon and ABE books and uh, the, uh, what is it? What's the new one that we're recommending, folks? Is it the bookstore.org, is it? Uh, do you know the new one that's been set up um, to rival Amazon or to... Is it bookstore.org? No, it's not. I don't know. Somebody will remember. We mentioned it recently. But anyway, try try searching for it online. I'm not sure if it's even uh, still available new. Tom Shanahan is in Hawks Bay. Cold and wet here at the moment. Same everywhere at the moment, Tom. Good evening to you. Nick Esk Casterton is in the house. Hello to you. Right. I th I, 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 I'm not sure if I missed anybody. This powerful analysis of the wise woman healer from the oral traditions of Ireland's rural communities is unique in its depth and perspective. Stories told and retold, embedded in the texture of culture and community, collected and studied for many decades, are here translated and made available to the general reader for the first time. The figure of the wise woman, the hag, the kolyak, or the red woman, are part of an oral tradition which has its roots in pre-Christian Ireland. In the hands of Gyaroj Okrulech, these figures are subtly explored to reveal how they offered a complex understanding of the world, of human psychology and its predicaments. The thematic structure of the book brings to the fore universal themes such as death, marriage, childbirth or healing and invites the reader to see the contemporary relevance of the stories for themselves. And this is from Nula Nidonal, who I presume uh, reviewed the book. This is a breathtaking book. It returns to Irish folk material, the emotional depth and imaginative meaning, which it always contained in its natural context, but of which it has often been stripped by the more utilitarian and commonplace interpretations long in fashion. It reminds me once again why I am charmed and enchanted by this material, and more than that, why I regularly find in it answers to the deep-seated obsessions of my own. A real gem of a book containing an exemplary methodology showing how the Irish folk tradition can be interrogated to find answers which are vitally important to our age and times. Something I've often said uh, about uh, mythology. Well, I'm usually talking about Irish mythology specifically uh, and probably go, uh, probably counts for most mythologies, uh, but that uh, just because it's about the past doesn't mean it doesn't have relevance today. The, and this is from another uh, reviewer, Thomas Moore, author of Care of the Soul and the Soul's Religion. The unearthing of a priceless spirit from forgotten, buried, misunderstood storytelling is like discovering Nouth or Newgrange and opening the doors to those other worlds. Garoj Okrilek's work on the wise woman healer, the Kalyak, is of immense importance, for we need to access so, sorry, for we need access to the secrets of healing and orientation in life known well in the past, but now neglected. Without that secret knowledge, we are left with mere rationalism and secularism, which are inadequate for dealing with the challenges of a complex world. 
This book is highly professional, comprehensive, carefully interpretive and respectful. It opens up many avenues towards the healing of our own personal lives and the world. It is of special importance to Ireland, but it also addresses the needs of people around the world who can now look to Ireland for the rediscovery of a special kind of spiritual knowledge connected to the natural world, to place and to history. This book is so rich in detail and implication that it can be taken by the reader as a personal map to the other world and to the forgotten powers of nature and humanity now accessible to him. To women especially, it offers an image of strength, wisdom and healing power. We need this kind of excellent work, visionary as well as academic, all over the world to pull us out of the literalistic and materialistic vision that is limiting us and perhaps even killing us. Um, apparently, a couple of people are saying the Facebook feed is a little bit stodgy. Um, hmm. As always with these things, uh, I find it difficult to to do anything about them once we have started, uh, except for to hope that the situation resolves itself fairly quickly. Um, yes, Emer Stassen says she needs this book. Hi, Emer. Yes, I think that a lot of people will. I know. Sure. Look, every book that I talk about on Book Talk, I recommend, of course. Um, these are books that have moved me in some way, uh, and I think I, I think the reason for that will become uh, fairly clear. And I'm going to read snippets. That's what I'm going to do. I don't want to breach copyright, as always. I will try to uh, limit myself to what we would consider fair use under Irish copyright law, uh, while also giving you at least a decent flavour uh, of uh, the bits and pieces that it contains. Now, in my view... Uh, Kalyak is not just uh, uh, pre-Christian. Uh, Kalyak is uh, a Neolithic uh, goddess. Uh, she is a figure that was there. Um, she's said to have created the Cairns at Loch Crew, for instance. She has left her name in many forms in the landscape on landscape features, natural and man-made. Uh, we heard Porigo Komsky saying he was looking up towards the Calivera's house on the top of Schlieve Gullion. Uh, we have the Kalyak's Cairn and the Kalyak's Chair, the Hag's Chair at Loch Crew. Uh, and they are on a, an alignment, uh, Schlieve Gullion and Loch Crew, with the Cat Stone or the Stone of Divisions, Isle of Mirren at, uh, at um, Ishnach. And of course, she's most famous uh, for uh, in the southwest. Uh, the the, uh, the Bera Peninsula, Kali Bera, and all of that. Uh, it is reckoned that she had many different names, including uh, Kalyak Boy, and in that form, she's commemorated by the great monument of Nauth, one of the great uh, mega mounds, as it were, of Brunabonia, where the story says that uh, she was interred there. Okay, some people saying the feed is okay. Uh, yeah. Hope, hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll sort itself out. And I presume everything's okay on YouTube. Okay. Among the characters or personages that feature most prominently in the mythological legends and literature of ancestral Irish tradition is the figure of the otherworld female. Kimberly Halligan wants to know the name of the book. It is the Book of the Kalyak, Stories of the Wise Woman Healer by Gyaroj Okrolek. And if you're watching on Facebook, that will be back to front. So I apologize for that. It's in. It's pictured in the graphic uh, for tonight's episode that you'll see uh, in the in the pre uh, in the pre episode blurb. This personage is regarded in traditional cosmology as the personification in divine female form of the physical landscape within which human life is lived and also of the cosmic forces at work in that landscape. These forces can range from the power of wind and wave seen at their most dramatic in fierce winter storms to the pastoral and nurturing fertility forces of plant and animal life orders within the landscape. They can also be the geotectonic forces 
whose workings have left the physical landscape as it presents itself to human consciousness and to human life. <clears throat> and for an example of that, uh, consider the old poem about uh, uh, the hag of Loch Crew. Uh, I am the Calivera. Many wonders have I seen. I have seen Carnborn a lake, though tis now a mountain green. And what she's saying there is the, the mountain that we call Carnborn, which is the westernmost of the four hills of Loch Crew, uh, smattered with all those megalithic passage tombs or cairns, uh, chambered cairns, uh, was once a lake, and that tectonic forces uh, caused it to become a hill or a mountain. So there you go. These are the claims that the Kalyak makes in this regard. We cannot... Uh, uh, likely throw such claims aside. In the working of that consciousness and in its many different articulations in literary and in other cultural forms, great diversity exists as to the functions and the specific cultural connotations of the various female figures who can be taken to perso personify aspects of experience. Prominent among them in the kind of oral narrative material with which this work is concerned, the legends of folklore, is the otherworld female, the Kalyak of Irish and Scottish Gaelic tradition, regarded as the shaper who has formed the features of the landscape. In the course of time, the figure, one thing I did not do is adjust the brightness, and I'm, can I do that? Ah, I can. I, I'm not sure. Hopefully that's not too bright. In the course of time, the figure of the royal mother slash spouse goddess undergoes transformation into that of the sovereignty queen and suffers stigmatization and displacement in the course of the development of the specifically patriarchal and Christian cultural world of the later Irish Middle Ages. This work will suggest that behind or beneath the official and learned cultural order which consigned the Kalyak figure to the discredited margins, vernacular culture and vernacular cosmology retained a, a more valued and centred sense of the otherworld female that not only endured but actively informed cultural developments, artistic political and ritual in the course of the early modern era. Now, bear, bear in mind that I am only reading snippets. Some of this may seem a little bit disconnected, and that's because I'm not reading uh, entire sections. I'm reading paragraphs uh, or, or, or shorter sections to give you a flavour. Thus, the meaning of a text, a text of literature or of folklore, is more than that of the surface plot alone. Beyond or beneath that surface dimension, other levels of meaningfulness are found. Two main levels on which we can recognise these Irish literary and folkloric stories as operating powerfully are the historic and the mythic. To be able to understand them and what they tell us we require to be aware of and alert to the way they carry reference to socio-political and cosmological traditions in Ireland on the one hand and to archetypal patterns of a universal human provenance on the other. We can regard them in this respect as being both learned and wise and glimpse something of the role they played in pre-modern society when they formed part uh, of a uh, Cunyaca, uh, a shared universe of Irish cultural discourse and uh, identification. And that word is Cunyaca. I apologise for my pronunciation. And, and here's something fascinating, because you know... Um, okay, Facebook seems to be causing people problems. Don't forget that we are also live on YouTube on youtube.com forward slash mythical Ireland. I know a few people are saying they're jumping ship. I didn't mention the F word. I don't know. And I'm not singing either. So I don't know what's going on. I do apologize for the technical difficulties. I did turn off my phone and restart it before we began, which is something I've been trying to do to flush out any, uh, you know, uh, uh, stuffed memory issues or anything like that. Um, 
anyway, hopefully everybody on YouTube will we'll see the YouTube figures rise as the uh, Facebook figures fall. In seeking to comment on them now so as to elucidate some of the significance they carried for their original audiences and still carry for ourselves as we confront them today in written form, we are facilitated by our recognition that while the search for meaning starts from the text, it necessarily goes beyond the text as well. And of course, this is in terms of interpretation of myth, something that, as you know, I'm very, very fond of doing myself. By beyond the text, I mean that in the context of past literary and cosmological tradition, and in the context of a common human concern, to discern meaning in the experiences that life brings, the meaning of text can be emergent rather than something fixed and unitary. And that is fascinating. Consequently, the work of interpretation is never finished. And look what I've done there. I've heavily underlined that and I've put an asterisk and, a, and an NB with an exclamation mark. That's how important that statement is. The work of interpretation is never finished. And something that I've hinted at in my own work, particularly in uh, Mythical Ireland and my Newgrange book, um, is that despite the passing of the ages and despite the much altered uh, political uh, landscape, of today's Ireland versus 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, myth continues to resonate into the present. We continue to relive aspects of our mythology. They never become irrelevant. They never lose their relevance. So, you know, by extension, the Kalyak never loses that sense of relevance that she has uh, to the ordinary people who would seek a meaning in her stories. Uh, rather than people who just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, read the stories for some sort of form of entertainment, uh, going beyond and seeking that meaning, because the work of interpretation, as Okrulik says, is never finished. Emer says, yes, the layers of interpretation deepen all the time. Exactly. Given a basic acquaintance with its traditional significance and functions, re-engagement with the text can lead to new insight and an understanding of the relevance of the text's meaning to our own circumstances and concerns. Oh man, I need to read this again. I am reading it again, but I mean again and again. Such an engagement with a traditional text is regarded by folklore scholarship as a valid form of reconceptualization or selective construction. A major part of the traditional significations of the stories represented by the texts dealt with in this book arises from the potential of narration to render present to the imagination and to the emotions figures who personify elements of ancestral knowledge. And of course, this is another hugely important aspect of mythology. I'm talking specifically about Irish mythology because I know more about it than any of the others uh, that uh, it, ancestral knowledge was a huge thing uh, in telling stories. These elements comprise knowledge of a profound kind regarding the human condition and the circumstances of human life in the world, which is conceived of as standing in contingent relationship to an other world, rendered accessible to the experience in the symbolic life of narrative and ritual. Fascinating stuff. In confining our attention largely to how the traditional narrative material dealt with here is able to give access to the presence of other world reality in traditional terms, we raise the question of its ability also to provide access to and to render present to the contemporary reader's imagination and emotions an order of reality that is talked about in some contemporary discourse as that of the unconscious and the archetypal uh, shades of Jung here. And again, I'm just reading sections, so it, it, it may seem a little bit disjointed, and hopefully I'm giving you a good flavour. On the one hand, we can suppose that every narration, oral or written, overlies and conceals other possible voices within cultural discourse whose narratives, if heard, would attest to alternative identities and identifications to those represented in the narrative claiming attention. As against this perspective, there is the point of view found in both disciplines that proper narrative scholarship consists primarily and well nigh exclusively 
in strictly textual work, the establishment of reliable texts and versions with little regard to or interest in possible evaluation or interpretation outside a textual canon. And isn't that true to a certain extent of the scholarship where the scholars are, have invested all of their energies into uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the linguistics and the onomastics and, um, you know, the strictness of uh, the uh, uh, translation of words from the uh, Middle Irish, for instance, into the English, etc., etc., and tend to perhaps in some cases lose sight of the bigger narrative, uh, which in some cases, I mean, in the folklore, in the, in, in the 19th and 20th century, for instance, um, uh, the sort of people who are still telling stories uh, among uh, the uh, uh, indigenous Irish were, were not using highfalutin words. Uh, they, they were not... Um, well, they might have been loquacious, they might have been talkative, uh, but they certainly were not furnished uh, with any sort of uh, uh, an ornate uh, 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 vocabulary, e either in the Irish or the English. They told the stories in a very straightforward kind of way. I hope that the type of discussion of certain texts from Irish narrative tradition undertaken in this work will be of interest to those for whom theory is a primary concern etc etc uh here, here this is i think it's a very good example it's not specifically related to the colleague i don't think but uh it's worth it, i think it's worth reading in a famous lecture to the british academy more than half a century ago entitled the gaelic storyteller seamus o dularga had this to say regarding sean o'connell uh, the elderly small farmer come fisherman from whom he had collected an impressive repertoire of narrative tradition. He had a local reputation as a storyteller in a parish where there were many storytellers and tradition bearers. He had never left his native district. He had never been to school, was illiterate, and he could neither speak nor understand English. He was a conscious literary artist. He took a deep pleasure in telling his tales. His language was clear and vigorous and had in it the stuff of literature. Now, I think we could apply that to all of the storytellers, uh, the indigenous storytellers, going back to the Middle Ages, going back to the early medieval period, going back to the first years of Christianity, going back to the Iron Age, going back into prehistory. Uh, how many of them would have gone to any sort of great school of learning. Yes, there were the Aes Dama and the poets and the scholars of, of the medieval times. Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, they uh, did learn, uh, y you know, uh, in schools, as it were. But the average uh, storyteller couldn't write or read. Everything was transmitted uh, orally. Now, I'm going to skip on a little bit. In the literary poetic, both of oral narrative performance and of creative writing, we encounter a verbal capacity that stirs us and moves us out of mere creaturely existence in the mundane workaday world, bringing us vital, vivid experience and acute flashes of comprehension regarding humanity and the human condition. So I suppose it's one thing to read a story. It's entirely a different thing to hear a story and to hear it as told uh, in the original form, which would have been in the vernacular uh, in, you know, I don't know how far back we're going in, in terms of the Irish language. Uh, some people say that that arrived with the Celts and the Iron Age, but, um, you know, uh, to hear the inflections and the rhythm and the cadences, the music that there is in storytelling. Uh, it's a much different experience to reading a story from uh, the stale, as it were, uh, pages of a book. Anyway, we need to get on to talking about the Kalyuk, don't we? So this is from the first section, which is called Tradition and Theory.
and again, just reinforcing earlier points. The texts of the oral narrative presented in this book and the commentaries offered with them bear witness, hopefully, to the way that traditional material, frequently seen as outmoded, naive, parochially bound, can constitute a rich imaginative resource for our own times and our own circumstances in a world where the local and the global are intermeshing at an increased rate for greater numbers and, pardon me, in ways not previously imagined. In other words, uh, we want to make the, uh, the old stories uh, just as relevant for today. And it's not that we want to make them so, it is that we have to see them as so, because that is the way it is. The evidence of prehistory and of mythology has been taken to suggest that in the old European Neolithic era, before the spread across the European world of Indo-European language cultures, cults of a mother goddess type prevailed throughout the continent. Ireland, too, was inhabited for thousands of years before the coming of the Celts, our first Indo-European immigrants, by peoples whose ideology can be understood to have encompassed religious and cosmological sensibility in respect of a divine female agency who was conceived of as the origin of the physical universe itself and of the life forms contained in its landscapes. On this western outpost of the old European world, the incoming patriarchal Indo-European cosmology of the Celtic-speaking cultures, established here by the technological and political hegemony of relatively small numbers of Celtic-speaking settlers, took on a significant characterization from the previously dominant matrifocal ideology. In the Irish case, the cosmology of the incoming Indo-European brackets Celtic ideology already had an element of that archaic identification of the cosmic forces of fertility and reproduction with a divine sovereign female landscape figure that finds its fullest historical expression in the early medieval literature of Wales and Ireland. Celtic cultural accommodation to divine mother goddess traditions of Neolithic old Europe was intensified in Ireland where an abiding sense of a supreme sovereign female cosmic agency appears to have operated on the incoming culture to a degree that resulted in a continuing powerful sensibility to the presence in landscape of such divine female agency, a sensibility that has remained at the heart of Irish ancestral cosmology and mythological legend. And Coda is agreeing, uh, agreeing uh, quite vocally. Uh, and just to give an example of this, uh, out of my own uh, immediate sort of uh, memory bank, you know, when the Milesians, and we often t re refer to Laura Gawala, uh, the Milesians are arriving into Ireland. What happens is that before any meeting with the kings of the Tua de Danon to discuss the terms of what's going to happen next, there is that meeting with the divine feminine agency in the form of the tutelary or guardian goddesses, Banba, Fola and Eru. And only when the Milesians uh, meet the goddesses on their terms and agree to name Ireland after them individually, only then can the action play out. In other words, that it never would have come to pass that the Milesians would have had an opportunity to meet the kings of the Dedanans at Tara to negotiate with them. It never would have come to pass that they would have gone out uh, to see by a distance of nine waves. And it never would have come to pass that they'd have been given an opportunity to land again, were it not for that vital consultation with the feminine agency. Neither should it be imagined that in pre-Indo-European ideology, a single monolithic mother goddess figure or cult existed throughout old Europe and in earliest Ireland. Such a conception is the product of modern and contemporary reconstructions that arise out of both Enlightenment humanism and, femini and the feminist liberation movement, and is without any real basis in history or ethnography. Uh, and I think, if I'm not mistaken in terms of what direction he's going with that, is that 
what he's saying is that it's not that there weren't uh, mother goddess figures. There were. It's just that the, the idea of a single one, uh, like a monolithic mother goddess figure, uh, is, is a modern idea. Well, I can immediately think of a, a few very important uh, feminine agencies in the mythology of the immediate region here in the Boyne Valley. I think of Bowen, I think of Bui, I think of uh, Kalyak, I think of Bridget, etc., etc. We can, however, distinguish between the notion of there not being any single tradition in terms of the history and cultural practice of peoples and a context in which certain fundamental experiences of human life can repeatedly find common forms of popular culture expression involving the symbolism of a mother goddess. In a real sense, the materials of folklore that feature the mother goddess, the otherworld female, are the products both of diverse ancient tradition and of depth psychology in the case of succeeding generations, which in itself is fascinating. The archaic and continuing Irish sense of a female presence at the heart of reality, at the centre of consciousness and culture, can be un understood as deriving jointly from two different projections of the life of the psyche in all humans. One of these has to do with individual psychoanalytic orientation of the human infant in respect of the mother from whom it is born and on whom it feeds and depends. The other is the symbolic collective association of the earth itself with the mother as both womb, site of life and nourishment, and grave, site of death and dissolution. Uh, fascinating. While separated in some cultural traditions into complementary archetypal and mythological figures of the good mother and the terrible mother, the Celtic and early, earliest Irish mother goddess figures combines into a single personage these contradictory aspects. Joseph O'Reilly is in Melbourne, Australia, for, formerly from, is that Legion Avenue in Dundalk? Uh, Joseph, very good morning to you. Very good to see you. The relationship of the Irish semi-divine hero figure, brackets, representing in narrative the male deities of the Celtic cosmological pantheon, with the goddess is a central theme of Irish tradition. The tales that relate that relationship and the transformation to which it is subject in the course of time in history bear out an observation of uh, Julia Kristeva's regarding the contrasting nature of what she calls woman's time as opposed to linear male chronology. In this view, woman's time, the temporal of the goddess, is cyclical, associated with reproduction and with cosmic rhythm. Uh, Bowen is a lunar deity, uh, the bright cow goddess, uh, and, and her cycle, of course, repeats monthly with the eternal that underlies history in comparison to the male hero's accomplishments and progress, a progress of historical succession that attempts to evade its mortality by means of making and leaving a heroic mark in the world. I could read, do you know what, I could read this all night. It's just such fabulous stuff. And I still ha I need to kind of get more onto the, the actual, there's so much material underlined. Oh... Do you think I should email Garo Jokruelak and and say, can we read your entire book uh, and and do several episodes? As discussed penetratingly by Maureen Nikon, this contrast between female cosmos and male history is further suggested by the views of other women scholars, such as Marie Louise. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name. I have her book here: S J O E S T E D T. Joe's Tet and Moira McNeil, whose work we referenced before uh, uh, the, the Festival of Lunasa, who draw attention to the domination of historical myths by divine and semi-divine male gods, whereas topographical myths recounting the significance of place and physical landscape present as a recurring theme, the association of specific locations with the deaths and burials of divine and quasi-divine females who give their names to landscape features and to recurring festivals held at these sites as sacred assembly or Enoch locations. Burr Whelan is in the house. Hello, Burr. And we have done lots, and we've spoken lots in live Irish myths about Enoch sites. Okay, we need to move on a little bit, so a little bit about the the Kalyuk. 
At the popular folk level, however, the figure of the divine female agency, the mother goddess of landscape, retains her autonomy and majestic authority in the local lore of place and thereby constitutes a traditional cultural resource contributing richly to the creativity of the popular imagination. All over the Gaelic world, in Ireland and Scotland, down to the present age, traditions of the Kalyak, the supernatural female elder, are to be found attached to natural features of the physical landscape. Mountains, lakes, rivers, tumuli, caves whose shape she has moulded and whose location she has fixed. And feature also in the abundant stories of supernatural encounter between humans and the native other world within that sacred feminine landscape. In many ways, the most prominent of these Kalyaka is the Kalyak Vera, or supernatural female elder hag of Bera, one of the great peninsulas of the southwest Irish coast. Bera is the site of the legendary arrival onto the island of Ireland of the human Gaelic population, the Milesian Gael, who partially displaced the mythological Tua de Danon from their former hegemony and caused them to withdraw from the mundane daylight realm into the subterranean and submarine realms of a sacred landscape in which they remain an immortal presence. And I should just uh, perhaps correct that a little bit in that while the southwest was where the Milesians arrived, they went and spoke to Bamba and Fola and Eru at Ishnak, then they went to Tara, where they spoke to Makul, Makhet and Magrania, but they put back out to sea and they finally landed at the Boyne Estuary, which is where their second and, I suppose, successful landing was made. Kalyak Vera, the hag mother goddess of Bera, is also known at the learned literary level as a personification of the territorial sovereignty queen. But it is in her presence in popular tradition, pardon me, that her autonomous creative potential resides. In her person, she constitutes in popular tradition an overarching female matrix of sovereignty and fertile power that is as vast and as untamable as the wild, wide landscape. And that is yet as nurturing and as in intimately fruitful for human beings and for human existences are as the services of the Ban Grunye, the midwife, the Ban Fasa, the wise woman, and the Ban Chuinche, the keening woman, to name three human female personae whose Kalyak inspired and derived performance of service to the community was so essential. Proactive female creativity and power is thus seen in Irish ancestral culture to be the major source from which emerges both the general form of the physical universe and the security and well-being of the social order in times of stress. Kalyak Vera it was and is whose power and activities have resulted in the shapes of hills, the courses of lakes and rivers, the locations of islands in the presence of the landscape of numerous, or, and the presence in the landscape of numerous other natural features. Thunderstorms, tides, wind and wave power all attest to the energy of her abiding presence in the physical realm. While traditional Irish cosmology has nothing to say of an original moment or agent of creation ex nihilo, as in out of nothing, and ab initio from the beginning. It privileges a cosmic female geotectonic power that has given shape to the form of the world throughout the ages. Nature is renewed eternally in the recounting of the tales of how Kalyak Vera impressed herself onto and expresses herself within a landscape made both vital and sacred by association with her divine and sovereign presence. Lexi Erickson says she is very evident at the cliffs of Moher. She is indeed. So, so many hags head. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I will draw your attention at this moment uh, to an investigation that I featured in my Mythical Ireland book, uh, which was on the Mythical Ireland blog, um, about a townland name here, about five, five or six miles to the northeast of me here, outside Drogheda, Cali's town. Uh, and it was often said that Cali's town was so-called because an order of black nuns that had settled there in, I think, the 1500s. Um, and in fact, 
when I went to look at Loganium, uh, uh, at the the the, play, the place name uh, records, uh, it had been named as Cal Cali's Town uh, in a, a couple of centuries preceding the arrival of any order of nuns to the area. So, in other words, Kaliak is another word for a, a nun or a veiled one. Um, so it, it it had its name before the nuns arrived. Uh, and my point was that it was likely to be named after uh, Kali, Kali Vera or the, the Kaliak, uh, rather than the nuns that allegedly gave it uh, its, uh, its, its name. Kaliak Vera it was and is, along with other local Kaliaka, who underwrites and legitimizes the performances and activities of a range of female roles that are filled on occasion by flesh and blood women whose confidence, authority and actual power in the performance of their services derive not from the indulgence of a largely patriarchal social order, but from an issuing forth into that order of an imperative grounded in the popular sensibility of a primarily female origin and order of being and well-being for human existence. Stories of paradigmatic encounters between representative human women and the female otherworld abound, and they reinforce in their retelling that sensibility to and that confidence in a female creativity that was characteristic of ancestral tradition in Irish culture down to our own era. With the modernization of Ireland involving language shift, urbanization and industrialization, and with the displacement of ancestral concepts of the native other world by the tenets of growing Roman Catholic ecclesiastical orthodoxy, the presence and the power of the creative mother goddess has been greatly diminished. Within modern, modern Catholic culture, the two available archetypal female roles are popular, popularly taken to be those of handmaid of the Lord and mother of sorrows, neither of which offers much scope for the exercise of autonomous female creative potential. There is, I would argue, undoubtedly a sense in which Irish Catholic devotion to the cult of the Virgin Mother of God owes something of its intensity and loyal endurance to its touching on sensibilities that earlier fed on notions of the mother of the gods, the female agency who reigned in physical life and whose assistance or hostility was said to account for many of the triumphs and vicissitudes of human existence. Similarly, I would argue that the much vaunted Irish openness to a sense of spirit, spiritual transcendence is not unconnected to ancestral cultural sensibilities regarding another world realm that was imminently close at hand, the realm of the she, and where it is often a female divine who is perceived as reigning in peace and beauty. Indeed, the lively susceptibility to interpret life events in terms of contact with this ancestral other world realm is found in popular culture in Ireland and Scotland until relatively uh, recently. Caitlin Moon is saying that she's not getting notifications when I'm live anymore. Disappointed I missed a good bit of this. Unfortunately, that is the story of Facebook. There are nearly 60,000 followers of Mythical Ireland on this page on Facebook, and very few of them seem to get notifications. My own wife uh, follows Mythical Ireland, and she does not get notifications of my live streams, unless I pay for them. And uh, well, I'm not willing to do that. So unfortunately, it's just a matter of trying uh, to check in. There is one feature on Facebook, which apparently uh, with pages, not with groups, I think it's only with pages, where you can see highlights or you can see all. You can select see all in the settings. Not exactly sure how to access that, but I think that might help you. Despite the differences of genre and of the context in which, as oral narrative, the transmission of Kalyak slash Ban Fassa stories takes place, these stories too, whether in spoken or written form, show in their own way how meaningfulness and relief can be achieved in affliction and how ancestral imaginative frameworks regarding the personified operations of cosmic power and cosmic forces can provide archetypal resources for the attainment of meaningfulness in the face of life 
experience. And that is the pedagogical uh, function of mythology, uh, I think, I could be mistaken, Campbell's four functions of mythology. And one of those was, uh, in, in, in his own words, I'm paraphrasing, was uh, to, to, to prepare us uh, for this life, this human life of ours, and all of the things that it throws at us, and all its joys and all its sorrows, all its challenges and afflictions, all its great days and its great triumphs. Whether regarded as literature or folklore, the Kalyak and Ban Fasa stories presented here are powerful and potentially therapeutic expressions of creative, imaginative life. They are imaginative products of past Irish vernacular cultural tradition, but have the capacity to contribute creatively to the cultural imagination of today's world too in ways that can be guided and legitimated by reference to the cosmological and historical contexts of their composition. And before we go, I uh, must read a story. I'm just reading highlight, highlighted paragraphs here. Uh, rather than being static, outmoded or regressive, these materials of Irish folk tradition can constitute a creative contribution to the life of the imagination today and to the imaginative enrichment of individuals who care to engage with them in creative ways. So we'll tell a story. Uh, and I think the, the middle section of the book, there are three major sections. And the middle section is uh, a recollection of stories. Uh, uh, again, these are, uh, I believe, by and large, selected from uh, the Irish folklore uh, collections. So here, just to take an example, uh, and there are a total of, is it 38 or, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll do my best to tell you how many there are. Uh, there are a total uh, of, I think it's over 30 anyway, of these stories where Gyaro Chokrolek has given the story and then interpreted it. Uh, and these are all related to, yeah, 34, all related to the Kalyak. So this one is called, Kalyak Vera's Shower of Stones, and hopefully that will be immediately familiar to some of you. Peter Kennedy's in the house from Balbriggan. Any cool info on the Kalyak's cairn on Schlieve Gullion? Well, I should immediately refer you, Peter. Yes, I have some very cool information because it is on a, a winter solstice alignment pointing towards the Kalyak's cairn at Loch Crew and also pointing towards uh, the Stone of Divisions uh, at Ishnak. What did I call that? Lines and circles. Was it that talk I gave at Ishnak in 2018? Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll copy that uh, link for you there, Peter, as a comment. On, well, I'll put it on YouTube uh, and Facebook as well. Uh, Peter, I'll just reply to your comment, hopefully. Will it let me do that? No. Okay, I'll just have to post it as a separate comment. So you'll see a, a YouTube link that perhaps you might be interested in reading afterwards. Uh, where was it? Oh, no, I didn't mark the page. Oh, I did. Kalyak Vera's Shower of Stones. There are two hillocks up in Pol, P-O-L-L, a grassy mountain upland at the far end of the parish of My Cullen. My Cullen. There is a great pile of fairly big rocks on top of one of the two hillocks. In olden times, when the Kalyak Vera was at her best, a row broke out between her and another Kalyak, another Vera woman, who could also fire a stone as accurately as any man of that time. Linda Moore is in the house. Hello, Linda. Anyway, they gathered up piles of rocks on the tops of the two hillocks one evening, and they were all set to pelt them at each other on the following day. I wouldn't like to get in the way of that. They rose at dawn and started to shower the rocks on each other, all unknown to the people of the place who were asleep for themselves. They were attacking each other with no idea of which of, which of them would be the victor 
when the Kalyak Vera started to fire her own rocks away beyond the other Kalyak. She, for her part, kept on trying to injure the Kalyak Vera and kept striking her with great l lumps that wrung sobs from her heart. She was that frenzied that she never noticed that her supply of rocks was almost used up and that her rocks were now nearly all across on the Kalyak Vera's hillock. She hadn't understood either the trick Kalyak Vera was playing, throwing her own rocks away past her so that they landed far out of her reach down the slopes. The Kalyak Vera's plan was to leave the other Kalyak's hillock with no rocks on it. When she found that this was the case, she attacked the other Kalyak again and she was pelting her until she had her beaten into a pile of bones at the top of the hillock. hillock. When the people of, that, of the place arose that morning, they found Kalyak Vera stretched on the top of one hillock and bleeding badly. She had buried the other Kalyak under the pile of rocks on the hilltop. Anyone who comes to that district today can still see the pile of rocks fixed on the hilltop with no other rocks anywhere near them. The rocks that Kalyak Vera threw down the slope of the hill aren't to be seen at all, as they've been swallowed into the marshy land that's there. That now is the reason why those rocks are at the top of that hill until today. Margaret McKenna says, so interesting echoes of the forming of the cairns, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, it uh, brings to mind, I remember having a eureka moment several years ago. A, fr a mutual friend of uh, Richard Moore and mine, uh, Richard and I wrote Island of the Setting Sun. Um, a mutual friend of ours who's from the Boyne Valley um, uh, told a story uh, about uh, uh, the man she uh, and that uh, before she had been heard, uh, there was a noise, a strange noise that was heard, which was like it was described as the sound of lots of stones being thrown into the ditch at the side of the road. And it was only years later uh, when I was reading probably O'Krulek and others uh, about, you know, this the, the shower of stones that I realised it's just a variant of the same story. The Kalyak tipping out the stones from her apron to form the cairns of Loch Crew. In this case, the, Ka the Kalyak Vera uh, and the other Kalyak throwing stones at each other across the hilltops. And the story of the Banshee and the noise of stones falling into the ditch it's all, it's all, uh, it's all basically, uh, they're all variants of the same story. So this is O'Krulek's uh, interpretation of what I've just read. What I've just read was uh, the original story, uh, again, uh, taken from, I think, the, the, the uh, folklore. I'll just very quickly check if I can uh, which story. CBE, volume 74. Okay, I was just checking for the reference. It's not easy to just discern at this stage. In this story and the following, we see the attribution to Kalyak Vera as shaper of landscape, of features of the physical environment, whether natural or man-made, i.e. artifactual. In the first story of the rock pile on the hill up near Moy Cullen in County Galway, we see how the legend has two individual versions of the Kalyak Vera <coughs> opposed as a kind of narrative device. Both are otherworld females with associations with Bera, the traditional heartland of the hag goddess of legend, and both can fire a stone, that is to say, bring about geotectonic changes in the environment and settle the rocks of the landscape into their, quotes, home form. Pardon me, I have to take a drink of water. We're not too long from the end of the episode now. In case you're getting uh, tired. Uh, Daisy Peters is asking if we can talk about the Banshee another day. Yes, indeed, that will be an episode of Live Irish Myths. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can understand the duplicated Kalyak figure here as a representation of the generalized, universal, sovereign dispensation of the otherworld female agency in olden times, when, as the text has it, the Kalyak Vera was at her best. The pelting match that takes place between the two takes place at dawn and unknown to the people who were asleep for themselves or had not yet come to awareness, had not yet settled or got to know the physical characteristics of the territory in which these cosmologically dynamic events are taking place at the dawn of consciousness. The row and its grievously injurious outcome is a metaphor 
for the terrifying cosmic energies that have gone into the rendering of the physical landscape of human times into its shape and form, energies beyond the tolerance of humans who live their lives in smaller and hopefully safer compass. The physical features of landscape today, however, and legends about its formation, remind the human community of the otherworld dimension of their environment, a dimension available to them in the legends and other imaginatively creative narrations of cultural tradition. Underneath, as it were, the tranquil appearance of the grassy mountain upland at the far end of the parish lies the profound energy that, in frenzy, can be said to wring sobs from the heart of even the divine agency and leave her beaten into a pile of bones. In the perspective that encompasses a sacred landscape such as this, the people and in, in imagination and its narrative expression are constantly finding Kalyak Vera stretched on the hills and requiring their therapeutic narrative performance of her story so that she may live on in their consciousness and their cultural tradition. In this engagement of imagination with landscape, it is fitting that the story should end with the apparently simple statement, that now is the reason why those rocks are at the top of that hill until today. Their continued existence, even as physical features in the natural environment, as is implied, depends on the narrative continuance of the legend of the Kalyakvera and the concomitant imaginative reendorsement of the truth of the worldview to which such legends give expression. I think we've time. Have we time for one more short? Let me just see if. Oh, I'm sure we've time. We've time for one more, have we? I mean, one more short uh, story of the Kalyak and, and an interpretation. Let's try this one. And this is uh, number six out of 34. The Kalyak Vur, B-H-E-U-R-R, and Loch Ba. In the olden times, on the headland of Mull, there lived a woman whom the people called Kalyak Vur. She didn't hail from the people of this world, since we are told that Kalyak Vur was a young girl when Adam and Eve were still enjoying the pleasures of the Garden of Eden. I, I, I won't go into now uh, how contradictory that is. Uh, anyway, she tells us in her own words, it, it contradicts the biblical narrative, of course. She tells us in her own words, when the ocean was a forest with its firewood, I was then a young lass. Let that be as it may, and far be it from us to doubt it. But it seems that Kalyak Vur evaded death in a way that no one was ever able to do before or since. On the western side of Mull, there is a beautiful lake that shows its blue waters to the heavens from time to time. Sorry, from the time the sun rises in the east until it sets in the western harbour. The waters of the lake lie smooth and calm, with never any tossing waves from the first time ever the Kalyak knew the Isle of Mull. But the story goes that something very unusual happened at Loch Ba every hundred years. When the Kalyak came each time to within two years of another century, a great change used to come over her appearance. She used to start to grow old and grey and pale and stooped like other old people. However, unlike other old people, she had the ability to transform herself into a young girl again without much difficulty. She did this by immersing herself in the waters of Loch Ba before any living thing, animal or bird, would have welcomed the sunrise. Thus, whenever she had put down a hundred years of life, she would cast aside from her the appearance of age and she would again be an elegant maiden. One of the days at a time when another hundred years was all but up and when the Kalyak was thinking that it would be best for her to immerse herself in the waters, she was descending calmly to the shore of Loch Ba just as the sun with its golden rays was rising in the east. When she was standing on the edge of the lake and just ready to immerse herself, what did she hear from a distance but the barking of a dog? 
Since Kolyak Vur was unable to keep it at a distance, the noise echoed off the cliff and the crags around Lochbar all at once, and uh, sorry, and the crags around Lochbar all at once answered back loudly. The Kolyak stood there where she was, listening to the noise, and after a while, when the life was going out of her, she called out in a loud voice, gave a step from side to side, tottered over and back and fell down to the ground with a great crash. Just as the life left her, she called out aloud. It's early the dog spoke in advance of me, the dog in advance of me, the dog in advance of me. It's early the dog spoke in advance of me, in the quiet of the morning across Loch Baugh. Further evidence of the identification of the Kolyak with, of this story with the archaic female sovereignty personification of landscape in the Celtic and possibly pre-Celtic ancestral cosmological tradition can be glimpsed in the assertion in her own words that she was alive in the pre-Diluvian, in a pre-Diluvian era when the ocean was a forest with its firewood, a, a, akin to the story, the, the poem about Loch Crew, uh, I am the Calivera, many wonders have I seen. I have seen Carn Bawn a lake, though tis now a mountain green. Something which is referred to in more detail in the second version of this story below, which we won't be reading because we're running out of time. The concept of the ancestral otherworld, the sacred cosmological domain that surrounds and underlies human experience of physical reality as a domain located beneath water, constitutes a recurrent theme in the allusions to the other world at the learned and literary level of early Irish tradition. Of course, we should say here that in his archetypes of the collective unconscious, uh, C.G. Young, of course, maintains that water is the uh, eternal symbol in, in the dream realm of the unconscious. We can also note the sense in which the name of the lake from beneath whose waters the hag goddess finds cyclical renewal in these two texts is evocative of the personal name Boi, B-O-I Fada, of the divine territorial sovereignty queen slash spouse of the divine Lu, himself the model and epitome of the king god of Celtic mythology. And of course, Boi uh, as Lu's wife uh, is the... the uh, uh, the uh, female uh, deity who is uh, buried at Nauth. And uh, in Dunchanicus, that is one of the explanations as to where it gets its name, Knoch Bui, Knogba, Nauth. Bui is understood to be etymologically related to the Indo-European word for cow, modern Irish bow, B-O, father, Scots, Gaelic, B-O, backwards father, whatever that is, generative singular ba, and to be evocative of the primordial cult of the cattle divinity, sacred bull, sacred cow. Luch ba is thus a name tinged with ancient and important associations within Gaelic ancestral tradition, in which the vernacular Kaliak Vera or Kaliak Vur of Irish and Scottish, Scottish fo folklore legend can be taken as a figure of mythology and cosmology, who is a transform of the boy prominently associated with the Beira Peninsula in early literary tradition. The lament of the old woman of Beira, dealt with in part one, had in the ninth century articulated as much in the line in which the old woman names herself as Kaliak Vera Bui. Regarding the exact translation of this, there is scholarly debate, but no dispute as to the co-occurrence in the name of the literary and cosmological elements that we find still conjoined in these Scottish texts of a millennium later, which we're dealing with here. And of course, I do apologise. I didn't uh, uh, realise at the outset of reading the second tale uh, that it is in fact from Scotland and not from Ireland. And uh, at the Isle of Mull, of course, is only across the way. We also note again the sense in which the sovereign presence of the hag goddess in the landscape of Loch Baugh represented in her noise, cosmic energy, when she called out in a loud voice, is overridden and deafened slash displaced by the overwhelming loud noise energy echoing from the crags and the cliffs of the culturally domesticated herdsman's dog, who has barked before she was able to reach the renewing medium of the lake waters. The landscape is now speaking with the voice of human society and her reign in it as the personification of the pre-human natural world is at its end, is at an end. In the quiet of the morning, at sunrise, across Loch Baugh, 
a monumentous cosmological shift occurred in mythology and in the imaginative consciousness of the tradition to which the 11 year old narrator story here gives renewed expression and so that was uh, that story was recalled to the uh, whoever the collector was by an 11 year old uh, fascinating stuff anyway there is a little glimpse into the absolutely extraordinary uh, the book of the Kalyuk. Uh, yes, the language at times is just a little bit weighty, it's a little bit heavy. Uh, at the same time, uh, Okrulek uh, shows himself to be an erudite scholar and a really uh, wonderful imaginative thinker uh, and plunges, uh, plums the depths of our myths and stories uh, to extract uh, significant meaning for today, which is something that I think is important because we're not just retelling stories uh, purely uh, for uh, their entertainment value. We're telling them as they were told all along, I believe, uh, as empowering narratives, uh, stories uh, that can uh, awaken in us uh, those uh, uh, self-same ancestral energies, uh, that connection uh, that goes back right into the mists of uh, time, into the mists of deep prehistory when our forefathers and foremothers, our uh, progenitors, is that what we call them, our forebears, uh, gathered around uh, uh, hearths, uh, especially in the nighttime and in the winter. And like we're doing now virtually, uh, told uh, stories. And those stories were an essential element of uh, uh, community life and society uh, in earliest times. And there's a very good reason for that, which I think O'Krulek has touched upon there in his great work. Uh, and that is uh, that uh, they are narratives that speak to us of the di dimensions uh, that are just that lie beyond uh, immediate conscious uh, perceptibility uh, by humans, but which are there in the form of uh, other world uh, realms and other world uh, divine agencies and, and deities, etc. Uh, who, who emerge, are emergent from those uh, realms uh, into our realm. And what is it that Joseph Campbell said? Uh, dream is a, pri a dream is a private myth. Uh, a myth is a public dream. Uh, and so we see uh, expressed uh, very wonderfully in some cases uh, the, uh, uh, the dream language and the dream uh, images uh, that stem from the personal and the on uh, the uh, collective unconscious, and spill out into the uh, the life of the greater connected community, uh, and something that is perhaps all too missing today from our, our uh, rationalist or post rationalist modern world, in, in which we consider th such things to be, as our Krulek said, uh, perhaps uh, na naive, outmoded. Uh, old-fashioned ways of talking and thinking and yet no there you have it at the center of them uh, are very very powerful images for us which can be very helpful to us even today believe it or not anyway i hope you've enjoyed yourselves that is book talk number eight i think wasn't it yes um we shall do more i'm conscious of the fact that i did not do a book talk last week uh we had a distinct lack of live streams last week we had uh, Monday of last week and we had Monday of this week and now Tuesday so I do not intend to do one tomorrow night I'm attending a Zoom lecture tomorrow night an archaeological lecture uh, which I'm looking forward to uh, but I may return I think I to make up for last week's darth of episodes I will do another episode of uh, book talk uh, if not I'll return with a surprise episode of Live Irish Myths but I think the fact that that's on Mondays sort of helps people to make sure that like, you know, it's Monday at 8 o'clock Irish or 12 noon Western on the West Coast or whatever, 3 p.m. New York, you know, that you're settled into the routine of being there on a, on a particular day uh, at a particular time. Anyway, uh, I think the greatest value, uh, there are two There are two reasons you should get the book of the Kalyuk. One, of course, is uh, that it brings together material about the Kalyuk, uh, uh, which... Uh, outside of that book is not readily available in a form where it's all brought together. And the other thing is O'Krulek's absolutely fabulous, erudite, scholarly, imaginative uh, uh, interpretation of that mythology. Uh, and, and of course, it's deep, deep meaning. 
Um, so uh, get yourself a copy if you can. I'm not sure if, as I said, they're available new, but uh, several people at the beginning of the episode were sharing links to online uh, bookshops where you can uh, search for such things. And hopefully you'll get your copy before too long. and You get lost in it like I did when that book arrived on my shelves some time ago. In the meantime, don't forget, as always, that we are uh, on Facebook uh, pretty much every day doing diff different things. Don't forget uh, to check out the website, mythicalireland.com. Today, uh, I shared um, my Sligo. Uh, there's a new page in the Ancient Sites section about uh, Car uh, Carol Carol Moore, and Queen Maeve's Cairn at Loch Nere. I'll share that link there now. Um, uh, and that is a very, very long page lots of words and lots of nice pictures hopefully you'll enjoy that uh you've seen at this stage i hope the video that was done uh first before that page came about and that was a sligo a megalithic odyssey if you haven't seen it i'll share the link to it there and don't forget also that if you want to become a patron and support Mythical Ireland it's patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland and you get rewarded for your patronage at various levels. Um, somebody says, uh, Valerie says, that page is so wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Glad you like it. I hope it was of some use. In the meantime, stay safe, everybody. Keep washing your hands. Use hand sanitizer, social distance, wear masks, cough and sneeze etiquette. Look, keep yourself safe. Uh, let's hope before too long uh, that at least those who want to take a vaccine can do so and that uh, we can start returning uh, to community uh, gatherings, R real people hugging, you know, shaking hands with real people, uh, real people chatting around a fire uh, and that we don't have to always do the, the virtual. We're very glad for it, by the way. Uh, a generation ago, if this had happened, we'd never have been able to do online learning or working from home uh, or uh, any of this uh, wonderful stuff that's been happening on Zoom and Facebook and, and YouTube and all these live streams. So we're glad for it. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, as I say. And we'll see you all before the end of the week, hopefully. As I say, I'll try and pick out another book and we'll do another episode of Book Talk. And then we'll be back for the second part of the Battle of the White Strand, Ka Fjontre, Fjontre, on Monday. In the meantime, uh, what is it I always say? Call Oh, hang on, we never had a joke. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm after, I had one. I had one ready. Um, oh, I had one ready. I do apologize. I had a joke ready. At the end of the night, telling jokes, that's no good. Um, My wife told me I had to stop acting like a flamingo. I had to put my foot down. Good night. Slongafol Kolosov Ikawa August Togobogi. Take it easy. See you soon. Good night, YouTube. <laughs>